So, Jillian, we are watching the markets all the time, of course, to see particularly how the equity markets are reacting to what they think the Fed's going to do. We had pretty robust economic numbers in the United States uh, this week. But at the same time, we aren't focused quite as much on the quantitative tightening part. There's a lot of concern about liquidity. You have some interesting thoughts on liquidity. Well, there's two points I want to make. Firstly, that people in the markets are unsurprisingly very obsessed with what the Fed is doing. Every time Jay Powell coughs, um, investors go mad. Um, and they're also very, very focused on the American data on inflation and growth, which again is totally understandable. But if you look more broadly right now, there's potentially two things they're missing. One is the fact that actually what's happening at other central banks outside the Fed matters enormously. Because quite apart from what the ECB is doing, you've got the People's Bank of China, which has been engaged in the recent months on something of a massive support program. And you've got the Bank of Japan that's about to get a new governor, which still appears to be taking a very dovish stance. And that is effectively putting more liquidity into the markets. In fact, I was looking at some great research from Matt King at City earlier today, which says that if you look at the PBOC and the BOJ, together they've added almost a trillion dollars of liquidity to the markets since last October. And the reason that matters is that I'm one of those people who believes that what's happening to asset prices is not driven just by the latest data on CPI, but liquidity and how much money is swirling around the system. Uh, one question is, will that continue? Obviously, as you just mentioned, we have Ueda-san now coming in to replace Kuroda-san. And there are some who think maybe that means the end of yield curve control. Well, it's a very interesting question, and I would implore anybody in America who just watches the Fed to widen your gaze and look across at the Bank of Japan. And not just because I used to live in Japan and I spent a lot of time inside the halls of the Bank of Japan, but because we simply don't know for sure what Ueda san is going to do going forward. And the reason it matters is the Bank of Japan until now has been quietly engaged in extraordinary monetary policy experiments. In many ways, they actually were a preview of what the rest of the Western world did because the Bank of Japan started QE a lot longer ago than everybody else. And there's a line of thinking which says that Ueda san has historically been very dovish. The signals he gave earlier were that he intends to continue the support because although Japan no longer has deflation, um, it's certainly not got significant inflation yet. And if the Bank of Japan keeps pumping out money into the markets, then what that means for American investors or other global investors is that what the Fed is doing in terms of trying to contract the supply of liquidity, QT, is being partly offset by what's happening in Asia. Well, I must say, I had not focused on this uh, infusion of more liquidity into the global markets. Is it possible that's in part what is supporting the equity markets, which have been doing pretty well so far this year, as a practical matter? On the other hand, what does it say about possible inflation? Because you have more dollars, yen, euros chasing the same goods. That's inflation. Well, there is a lot of people out there right now who say, well, actually, what's happening in the equity markets is all down to the real economy data. And certainly, it matters importantly. But I do think the fact that QT is being partly offset by a continued QE in Asia is one factor playing into it. I mean, just going back to the charts that City have put together, you can see very clearly that if you look at what's happening with the Fed, and to a degree the ECB, it's going down. But then if you look at the Asian pattern, it's been going up. Now, whether Ueda-san at the Bank of Japan carries on in this stance is actually unclear at the moment um, because he's given some fairly contradictory signals in recent days. Um, and, you know, the scale of the Bank of Japan's experiments are absolutely stunning. And there are a lot of people inside the Japanese system who are quite concerned about the future implications of this. I mean, one of the tiny vignettes from my time in Japan back in 1998 was being taken down a corridor in the Bank of Japan and seeing portraits of the former governor and someone pointing out to me that some of them had been assassinated in the interwar years because they were perceived to have messed up financial policies, you know. Um, I mean, I kid not. <laughs> and obviously that was a very long time ago. But Japan, unlike a lot of Western countries, mm -hmm. has a folk memory of what can go wrong when monetary policy spins out of control. It's a bit like the Germans today who still recall what happened with hyperinflation. And so there is a certain degree of nervousness inside Japan about the way policy's been going. So don't rule out a policy shift and don't ignore the fact 
that that could impact global markets. Jenny, let me add one other potential complication, and that's the debt ceiling crisis. And it's probably not too strong a word to say crisis looming in the United States. You know so well. There's been a lot of concern about what the Fed might be doing with liquidity here because of the, the debt crisis really comes on us this summer. We're going to have some challenges. How does that play against the liquidity issue? Well, that's a critical issue, and in fact, I wrote a column about that recently, pointing out that there's never a great moment to have a debt crisis. But it's a particularly bad moment when you are embarked on this astonishing monetary policy experiment called quantitative tightening or attempted quantitative tightening because the scale of what the Fed is trying to do in terms of shrinking the balance sheet, leaving aside the issue of what the Bank, Bank of Japan is doing, the scale of what the Fed's doing is really very significant. And one of the things that concerns me is that we know the Treasury's market is actually quite fragile in terms of its underlying structure. Um, the reason is a bit complex and too complex to go into, but it's to do with the fact that you don't really have market makers in the system anymore, keeping markets stable in a crunch. We saw what that means in March 2020, during the early days of COVID, when the Treasury markets came really close to seizing up completely. We've had other mini flash crashes and worrying periods as well. And if we have a debt ceiling crisis, coupled with the fact that essentially the Fed is trying to stop buying government bonds and we don't yet know who's going to buy them instead, you've got the makings of, if not a new crisis, then certainly a lot of risks.